welcome. My name is Abraham Newman, and I am the director of the Mortara Center here at Georgetown University and a professor in the School of Foreign Service and the Government Department. Um, I'm thrilled to host today the next installment of our uh, ongoing speaker series called GPEPR. It's a conversation on race and the global political economy. And today we're going to focus in particular on the issue of race and international development. Um, I want to, before I get into the substance of the conversation, I just want to acknowledge that Georgetown University's success today uh, is in part the product of enslaved labor and the sale of enslaved people. And you can learn more about Georgetown University's effort to understand and address these issues at slavery.georgetown.edu. So just as a little bit of background, this uh, speaker series is part of a larger initiative that uh, I have been um, working on with Kate McNamara here also at Georgetown, where we're trying to rethink um, how uh, we should study the global economy. And in particular, trying to put people at the center of that uh, enterprise. And for those that are in the audience and are interested, we have a pre-doctoral uh, fellowship, two of them that are, the submission deadline is this week. So if you have not applied, apply now. Um, we are interested in all pre-doctoral fellows. And in particular, we have one slot that it has a focus on China. So hopefully that information, the interfolio uh, submission is in the um, chat. So now if I could ask my speakers to start their videos, I see Nas and Olivia, perfect. Um, I just wanna quickly introduce uh, both of our speakers. So um, first we have Professor Nazneen Barma. Uh, she is the director of the Doug and Mary Schreibner Institute of Public Policy and an associate professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Uh, we also have senior lecturer Olivia Rutazibwa, who is a senior lecturer in European and International Development Studies at the University of Portsmouth, UK, and a senior research fellow at the Johannesburg Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, I am so excited to have uh, this conversation today and both of our speakers and how the event will work is I'm going to turn it over first to Olivia for 10 minutes and then to Nas for 10 minutes. Um, we'll have kind of a back and forth conversation, very kind of Terry Gross style uh, from Fresh Air, and then we're going to go to your questions. So if you have uh, thoughts or comments, please put them in the Q&A and I'll start queuing up those ideas. Uh, for the second half of the show. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Olivia to get us uh, going and then um, to Naz. Thank you very much for having me. Um, let me try to share my screen. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I actually made one slide, <laughs> which we'll see whether that's gonna help me um, to be, um, let me see. Um, there we go. I hope everyone can see that. Does that look like a slide? So, um, yeah, my name is Olivia Jesu, and um, I will be speaking today. I think, um, I mean, obviously, I'm going to try to give a uh, solid academic grounded commentary, but somehow I think also because we're talking about race, but also specifically because of the particular moment we are, and let's say, I wanted to say a global awakening, but let's say a Western world awakening to the fact that race actually matters. Um, I will also try to give some commentary, I guess, from maybe more activist background, but also very much also as a, as a former journalist. So what I will do is actually try and share um, some context um, in which I want to paint some of my comments um, and then throw some concepts at you, not to be abstract, but actually maybe as a way to frame some of the arguments uh, or the conversations we can have. And then obviously in the q and I would be really happy to give some more examples if possible. So for me, the context in which I want to comment on this title of race and international development, um, I see it as part of a wider conversation where I um, really locate international development as a conversation that is about international relations. And I don't just mean the international relations as a discipline, but just how do we live together beyond our own borders kind of 
thingy, but also obviously how that impacts uh, the inside of countries' borders, right? And very concretely, um, the background around, uh, against which I painted today is, is very much what we've seen that is international is and the national is, is very much um, debated on in public opinion, but also in academia, right? So very concretely, if, if you wonder, maybe some of the pictures up there, the red one is uh, referring to um, a collective piece that I contributed to in foreign policy this summer, where the magazine asked us um, to reflect on the kind of absence of race, racism, colonialism in international relations studies, broadly speaking. Um, but just before that, we also had a big role, and maybe that was more in Europe than, than in the rest of, uh, of the Western world, around securitization as a theoretical approach, securitization theories um, in, in IR where uh, a piece had come out uh, explaining the, um, the connections to whiteness and racism within that quite critical approach to international relations, right? So the, the, the conversation about how do we seem to not escape um, not talking or reproducing race and racism, even in the more critical corners of our conversations. And obviously in the much wider context, we have seen um, the Black Lives Matters protests uh, this summer, and then the latest iteration. I've really told myself I want. I didn't want to comment on it, but I'm speaking to you all from the UK, so the whole um, painful discovery, and I say discovery of race racism within the monarchy, right? So with the interview uh, that Oprah Winfrey did with uh, Meghan and Harry. The reason why I bring this up because I think it it it. It's trivial and not trivial, but the reason why I bring it up is um, what I want to hang the comments that I'm making next on is I think um, a sense of impatience I feel in myself, but I think that could be really generative for us to embrace with the ritualized consternation when we are confronted with stuff to do about racism, right? Um, and, and in this particular interview, even, even voiced by somebody like Oprah Winfrey, who obviously knows about racism, but you know, this, this consternation of, oh my God, is that what they ask? Is that what they said? And there is something much more serious to that consternation that actually I want to address that speaks in a very particular way to international development. So what I'm offering here would be, um, let's say a handful of uh, concepts that I think that could be useful for us to think what needs attending to if we do not want to engage with race and racism as this fashionable thing that we do once a decade. So you know, one thing would be quite important to, to flag up that these conversations really always come back, right? So um, not that it's that important, but it's important, I think, to honor the fact that nothing of this conversation is new. I don't think that newness is a thing we should strive for, but it allows us to understand that there's a lot of material out there that could help us shortcut some of these things. So I think points I want to raise here are really an invitation to how can we shortcut, just go quicker, because it is um, a conversation that is connected to life and death, right? So that's how I try to find my own cynicism or impatience. So on the one hand, I want to speak very briefly to uh, the need to uh, be attending to um, what James Baldwin and now in the latest iteration to the work of Eddie Glaude um, has been called the lie. Um, additionally, I think it's useful if together with that, we try to attend to what Sabelo Ndlovogacheni has called cognitive empire, building on insights from Gugiwa Chongo, for instance, and next to the cognitive aspect of it, uh, really important to connect that to the very material aspects of the international and aid and development being part of that. Let, and you know, people have coined it the racial colonial capitalism. If we were to include that in our conversations about international development. I think it would help us a lot. Um, and then um, certainly uh, somehow it's also really important to attend to desires of mastery and to check if we are witnessing this location of power or if it's business as usual. Um, and then lastly, 
this um, again, we'll see how, how far I get in the 10 minutes of which I've already <laughs> used many. But uh, in my own work, I've tried to formulate it around this concept of anti-colonial solidarity um, has something to do with attending to dignity, ethical retreat and repair. Again, as topics that can help us guide our thinking, not as the new preset only ways to think about it, right? So it's more uh, in a generative way. So very briefly, attending to the lie. And so I guess some of the, 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 the concepts I offer here are a combination of uh, building on decolonial thought and building on black radical thought. Uh, not necessarily as, I mean, they're distinct or they're different traditions, let's say, but I have to say more and more, these speak very loudly to me at the same time. And I think it's, uh, it will be very useful for many of us to center them in our scholarship. Um, not, yeah, more, mainly because their absence, I think, often in international aid and development studies in general. So what is meant with the lie, and I mean, somebody like uh, James Baldwin or Eddie Glott, they obviously focus specifically on the American experience and the experience of African-Americans within that society is the lie of um, the value gap in human life. And I would say for our conversation, it would be quite interesting to expand that in terms of the lie of the value gap of life in general, right? What is important in there, so the, the, the lie or the gap is basically that some lives are more valuable than others. And it sounds, almost so simplistically straightforward, but I do think that's the challenge. Can we study international development against that threshold, the extent to which it reproduces that or not, right? And so the value gap, the, 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 the fact that it's connected to life or death or that it's the lie is because a large chunks of our societies are organized around institutions that are built to reproduce that value gap, right? And one of them is what Gloria Becker has called, for instance, something like white innocence. So if we start looking at white innocence or innocence, or the move to innocence, colonial amnesia is another one, as technologies or institutions within our societies to maintain the value gap, it's not very difficult to make a jump and try and understand to what extent international development as a discourse and a practice is one that is subservient to this idea of innocence. And, and the reason why I say this is that, that, that it doesn't seem problematic to call after colonialism and everything we've seen, what we are trying to engage with from a North-South relation perspective as something as aid. The idea of aid does not hold up, does not hold up after historical analysis of what, how the world developed and how inequalities were developed, right? So the idea of aid in and of itself then becomes almost obscene. That's something uh, I wrote in the foreign uh, policy piece. So I think the lie, the reason why I bring it up here uh, is that, again, as I said, it's a way to, to, to accelerate the deconstructive work that has been done for at least four decades by so many scholars from different angles, post-development, post-colonial feminist, like there's a lot of radical approaches that have done it. So again, not to say that it's anything new on the table, but maybe rather than just say, let's critique it, let's uh, look at the biases, whatever. If we call it a lie, it's already quite much more powerful. Obviously, people might think and trip over the intentions behind it. I don't think, um, it's not an argument about intentions, it's about an argument to, um, to uncover it slightly more quickly. Um, so to move on um, to this idea of attending to cognitive empire and uh, racial colonial capitalism is somehow to have a way to speak both to material and immaterial aspects of the colonial encounter. And obviously uh, transatlantic slavery is, is part of that, but how um, both need attending to if we want to have a meaningful conversation of the role of race in international development or just a conversation by decolonizing international development, if any of that is possible. So I put them here together because I do think they need to happen at the same time, but they can't be conflated to uh, each other. Concrete examples in aid and development obviously is trying to think how much space is there to reimagine democracy in different ways than the liberal uh, versions that we have of it. And again, a lot of other examples can, can come to the fore. We also see a lot of um, attempts to, let's say, push back against Western imposed ideals. 
And that's what invites me as makes me invite you all to, to think of the next ones, the ones to do with desire for mastery and dislocation of power, towards um, participative approaches, grassroots approaches, all of that. In the grand scheme of things, I think these should be really um, uh, somehow um, judged or, or looked at against the actual dislocation of power that happens or not. And I think the biggest challenge for the ideas of especially North South's international development side is very much that we change language often, we change attention often, obviously we change buzzwords in, but there is a difficulty to understand how an actual letting go of desire of mastery and dislocation of power, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's possible within what we think of aid and development today. So that's why I often also say that I don't think international development is decolonizable or is um, that it's a, that it's possible to move away from uh, from race and racism um, to that extent in the way that it's built built up. But again, I want, I'm happy to talk about it later. So that brings me to um, to turn to the last point that I'll keep very brief here, but it's somehow to come back again to my own fight against my own cynicism or tiredness or any of these things, because all these conversations are happening at the same time. But it's this reminder of um, the idea of, of solidarity beyond borders is not something that is impossible and it's part of the human condition, I think, right? So, but what could be useful ways to think about it? And as I said, if I think of it as situated and grounded in the Western positionality, even though mine is, uh, is multiple and complicated as someone from the diaspora myself, but I do think that from a Western positionality, if we are not willing to foreground the idea of dignity as um, in opposition to the lie on the one hand, but also if we start to understand our understandings of aid and development as colonial impositions in the present, we need to be able to think of where do we need to retreat, whether that's cognitive or whether that's uh, in terms of um, the racial colonial capitalist on understandings of um, the global order and, and its reproduction. But I think to make sure that we don't go back to the moves of innocence or this desire to only think of development as a presentist thing where we don't have to think of the, the past, rather than ever, ever, ever speak of aid again in any shape or form, um, I do think we need to try and conceptualize repair. And that does not have to be just financial. But I think an idea of repair is an example of where we have a dislocation of power because the others will set the agenda for us where if we keep on talking about aid or cancellation of debt or any of these things, there is no dislocation of power in any way. So I'll, I'll end it here. A lot of it is quite vague and abstract, whatever, but I, I really hope it just um, offers some, some ideas for reflection. So thank you very much. Let me stop the share. Thank you so much, Olivia. And now I'm gonna to turn to Naz. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, forgive me, I'm not going to share the full screen so that I can, I can also uh, look at my notes at the at the same time. But um, you can see my slide, right? Um, so I um, thank you, Olivia. I, I you know learned a great deal from uh, from your talk, and I think what you've uh, given us is a, is some vocabulary and a conceptual framework uh, that will really help. Um, put in order some of my much more loosely uh, collected uh, thoughts here. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to having our, our conversation. And Abe, I hope you're gonna be more Kojo Namdi than, than Terry Gross. So I look forward to that. Um, I, for those of you who haven't yet read um, Olivia's work, I highly recommend it. I've, I've really learned a lot um, from reading it. So I, unlike Olivia, I'm, I'm not a scholar of race and development, um, but I have spent the better part of my professional career working as a development practitioner uh, at the World Bank teaching the political economy of development and, and development policy and researching and writing about different elements of the intersection between development and governance uh, in the East Asia Pacific region. And mostly I've really come at that from a positive pers positivist perspective um, and with a pragmatic orientation. 
Um, so when Abe asked me to join this event, my, my first thought was that I actually don't know very much at all uh, from an academic perspective about race and development. Um, and um, this has given me an opportunity to, th to reflect in the ways in which race and colonialism and the kinds of uh, things that Olivia was just talking about have really been lurking in my work and the ways in which I've been complicit in much of what um, Olivia was, uh, was just kind of laying out for us. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly, briefly reflect on four different elements over the, the next few minutes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about development projects, about development theory, about development cooperation, and development policy, and try and, uh, again, loosely collect some of my thoughts here. So the first picture uh, that you have here is of Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, um, you know, it's an easy person to beat up on. Uh, but you know, having worked in development aid, I have been that person in the middle of the circle, right? The, the white man sort of uh, preaching uh, to the black and, and brown people, um, kind of sitting, you know, uh, at, at his knee, as it were, in this picture. Um, and I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, a book I just recently reread, Nina Monk's uh, book, uh, The Idealist, which is about Jeffrey Sachs and his Millennium Villages project. Um, and I read it for the second time last month since I just assigned it in the development policy course uh, that I'm teaching. So very briefly, you know, Jeffrey Sachs's reputation, uh, you know, uh, um, precedes himself. Um, his theory of development is represented in the end of poverty is that the poor stay poor because of poverty traps. They can't rise out of poverty on their own. They're living in a condition of destitution, which is the condition of living at the margin. And the development then uh, sort of diagnosis that comes out of that um, is a particular aid solution, uh, a massive and holistic jolt in, in, in foreign aid. Um, and, and Sachs implements this vision um, in the Millennium Villages project um, in the early 2000s. Um, in a dozen locations in, in 10 sub-Saharan African countries, um, having raised $120 million from, from mostly private donors like, like George Soros and, and, and so on. And I think we, we sort of all know um, the story here and, and the critique of Sachs um, and this notion that a grand scheme type of development approach uh, could work. Um, but I, I wanna just reflect on how I, I thought about the critique 15 years ago and how I thought about it now more recently and teaching about this in the current moment that we're in. So in 2005, uh, when I had just left, um, um, uh, when I was actually just about to, to start again working at the, at the World Bank, the critique that I think we took to heart at the time was the folly of the New York Western kind of conceived log frame oriented top down notion that if we just technically engineer everything correctly, we can solve the problem of global poverty and of development right. And it's too easy to critique that we can see the hubris and the fixation on the particular model and the folly of this sort of intransigent belief that you know we can somehow understand the whole system and just engineer all the parts of it and in a way that we can bend it to our will. But this time, when I reread the book, I took something else to heart entirely. And I had the good fortune of actually Nina Monk coming to class and speaking with the students. So, so being able to hear from her, um, you know, what um, sort of what she has taken away, you know, sort of 15 years later from her interaction with Jeffrey Sachs. And what she's really documenting is the chasm that exists between those running the project and the villagers who are subject subjects to the project, which is at heart a chasm that is about colonialism and race, right? Um, so the specific problems, uh, programs that Jeffrey Sachs um, uh, implements in, in, in the Millennium Villages project come up against villagers incentives and realities in ways that just don't work because they not only rub up against the indigenous nomadic pastoralist culture uh, that the, these interventions are supposed to sort of engage with, but they basically utterly dismantle that indigenous way of existence as part of the actual development plan. So on this rereading for me, one of the saddest aspects of this story was how the socio-political and economic system of, uh, of in, in the village that I'm talking about that Nina Monk focuses on two villages, one especially in the um, Somali uh, plains called Dertu. Um, and she talks about how this nomadic pastoralism was essentially replaced with urban squalor. So the outcome of a development project, the outcome of a project oriented toward modernity and development uh, was to erase the indigenous way of life and the lived experience. And by privileging Western capitalist technocracy and development as a sort of modernization model was to instead situate uh, the, the, the black and brown people who are the subjects of this approach to an urban uh, sort of problem of overcrowding and sanitation problems and, and, and so on and, and so forth. 
So, you know, again, Jeffrey Sachs and this kind of approach to development is too easy to critique, but I think in development, um, in development economics since then, the answer to this, you know, the grand hubristic schemes don't work, was supposed to come from the more finely grained empirical work um, that would inform bottom-up development inspired by the likes of the randomistas, right? So, you know, we all know that Esther uh, Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, and Michael Kramer won the Nobel Prize in, in 2019 for their work on randomized control trials uh, geared toward better understanding the incentives facing the poor with a view to proposing better targeted uh, development interventions. But this comes with problems of its own, right? If we kind of think about the framework that, that Olivia just gave us, um, I just was just reading uh, this week the, some of the uh, commentary of, uh, um, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Grieve or Griev Chelwa, who's, a, who's an African economist uh, in, in a South African economist, who identified in particular two problems with the randomized control trial approach to development. First, that this is unethical and even harmful sort of study design and uh, it, it being conducted on poor black and brown research subjects that would never uh, in, in many ways pass our human subjects um, uh, you know, requirements here uh, in, in, the, in the Western world. And what Chalwa also identifies is how extractive this study and practice of development is, again, on the people who, uh, who often do not have a direct say in being experimented upon. So, you know, in short, kind of what I'm trying to get at here is the, all the ways in which we work and conduct research and development um, are, you know, reproducing, and Olivia just said this very eloquently, they're reproducing colonial practices that silence our research partners and, 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 and participants. I wanted to, let me just turn to the, the next slide, and this is a, 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 a series of photographs by, um, I think, a Dutch photographer named Jan Banning, uh, who takes photographs of bureaucrats around the world, and it's, it's fabulous, uh, fabulous photography. Um, you know, and what I wanted to represent with, with this picture was the notion of the state or the, or the bureaucratic state. Um, so recently, I, um, I'm the co-editor of a, a reader on political economy with Steve Vogel at um, UC Berkeley. And I just recently wrote a chapter on the waves of development theory and development dogma that we've kind of seen uh, in development theory from the 1950s onward. So the wave of the dirigiste interventionist uh, approaches to uh, development in the 19, from the 1950s through the 1970s. And then of course the neoliberal wave that followed in the 1970s through the 1990s. And a question that, uh, what, as I was writing that chapter, I was more focused on the relationship between states and markets because that's sort of really the heart of the, of the book. But for today's purposes, it got me thinking about how those different waves of development dogma have negatively affected marginalized groups in developing countries in different ways. And so the, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, the interventionist wave was part of the post-colonial uh, you know, impetus toward self-sufficiency, toward getting rid of the colonial legacies that had so damaged uh, the, the developing world um, and, 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 and so on. Uh, the neoliberal wave, of course, wrote, wrought havoc on black and brown populations across the world, including in the West. We should, we should uh, acknowledge uh, in, in terms of Olivia's framing of the moment that we're in uh, uh, today the Black Lives Matter movement here in the United States and, uh, you know, the racist uh, um, uh, um, racism that persists, of course, in, in the United Kingdom and, and Western Europe as well, and how uh, neoliberal capitalism has contributed to, to, to that. Um, the, the point I want to make uh, with this slide is that where the pendulum kind of ended up settling, I think, in the 1990s, from the interventionist wave to the free market wave was an emphasis on the role of good governance and state capacity and development, the importance of service delivery and earning governance, government legitimacy through the state society compact. And the East Asian developmental state was sort of the iconic representation of that, right? That this is what you can achieve if you have an indigenous capitalist corporatist class uh, working in alliance with a strong Weberian state, you can achieve industrialization, growth, and indeed development. And so, reflecting on that for our conversation today, um, you know, it sort of becomes again sort of obvious in some ways, but not something I've, I've thought about uh, as much as I should have about how the bureaucratic state itself in the developing world is the continued manifestation of colonial hierarchies and, and strategies of domination. And Olivia just just said that. Um, you know, in a slightly different way in terms of the ways in which these institutions persist um, in, you know, in forms that we don't sort of uh, ne necessarily um, recognize. The, 
The third point I want to make is if we start to think about the state as an instrument of, of hierarchy, dominance, uh, oppression, and so on, I'm also reminded then, though, that this isn't just a problem of development aid or development cooperation per se. Um, and, you know, I uh, have contributed to a, a research agenda and a sort of series of commentary pieces on the notion of the world without the West. And the, the point that I would want to make here is that um, you know, if not Western uh, orient, uh, Western uh, generated and imposed development aid, could South-South development cooperation be an answer in some way to, you know, abolishing aid and toward moving toward the types of dignity and, uh, you know, ethical retreat and repair that, that Olivia uh, um, was just talking about? And here, I don't think so. I think you know the 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 notion of the world without the West is somehow being uh, decolonialized, or that that South South cooperation itself doesn't have an ele element of uh, racial hierarchy and dominance sort of also embedded in it. I think is really problematic, right? So the answer is not just let's get rid of Western development cooperation. That's the problem. We can we can work on sort of South South cooperation. Uh, instead, that kind of brings with it its own, uh, you know, uh, problematic uh, um, uh, forms of power hierarchy and, and, and so on and so forth. And then the last point I want to make, and I think I've, I've also um, uh, used up uh, more than my uh, allotted time, is to think about in, in terms of uh, development policy itself, you know, again, to sort of um, ask the question of, well, what should we be doing uh, if we do think that there is a development to be uh, to, to be achieved? And I think that that is an open question, as, as Olivia kind of noted. But to think about one of the core elements of what development policy is geared toward is um, toward service delivery to, um, you know, poor populations in the developing world to ensure the kind of basic forms of economic well-being that Amartya Sen sort of characterized as development is freedom, right? We are more free if we're more healthy and we're more educated and so on and so forth. And so what can be done in order to achieve those goods um, if we if we you know think that we, we can still characterize them as such. Um, and here I would just sort of come back to my to my thought about the the, the state as itself a, a, a racialized often uh, bureaucracy is that if you know we say we're going to uh, abolish aid or get rid of aid and kind of turn to indigenous practices themselves. Um, I mean, I think we need to recognize that um, the indigenous uh, elites in many of the countries in which we're talking about, in my experiences in uh, Southeast Asia, the state itself is an instrument of hierarchy, dominance, and oppression without the outside world kind of coming in, right? So I'll end here with one uh, very short story, which is I, I worked for a long time in the Lao People's uh, Democratic Republic. Abe will remember uh, the, the time that I that I spent there. And I worked in particular on, on, on service delivery in the World Bank. Um, you know, kind of working on rural health and education and electrification and so on. And one of the things that the Lao government was really focused at, focused on was what they called these development village clusters. The idea was we can solve the last mile problem in service delivery by bringing people, uh, you know, to the, the point in which services are delivered. So you build these village clusters. And, you know, there's this kind of technocratic uh, rationale for this. This will improve access to everybody. We will improve all of our development indicators and so on and so forth. And of course, if you stop to think about it for more than 10 seconds, what's also going on is the Lao states and the governing regimes coercive resettlement of its population uh, to kind of you know align it with its vision of what the Lao nation state is all about and 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 so on. And so I just want to kind of end with a final kind of plea, I guess, that we can kind of focus some of our conversation on what is the alternative? If we think you know Western uh, aid and sort of development models are, are problematic, if we can agree that South-South cooperation is, is similarly fraught, um, and then we can also uh, um, agree that you know we leave it to indigenous elites themselves, um, it may not be the case that the outcomes uh, are, are those that we would want to see from a human rights and, and social justice perspective. Um, what um, what instead uh, should we should we be doing? And I would end with a, a positivist appeal and a, and a pragmatic question. I think we can and should understand and measure development and even make causal claims about what gets us better outcomes. We have to recognize that the vast majority of those claims may not actually be susceptible to policy. 
Um, but for those elements that can be improved by better policy, the goal, I think, should be to understand, measure, and implement better so that we can continue to push for um, development as, again, to use Sen's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conceptualization of it, um, ever expanding human capability and freedom. Thanks. Great. Um, <clears throat> I just want to thank both Olivia and Naz for those great introductory uh, remarks. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with um, the problem. Uh, so just the, the, you know, the the way I think about the conversation is that there's this problem, and then there's the question of is there a set of solutions that we could address that problem with? And I wanted to bring um, Errol Henderson. He had a comment in the Q and A, which is, you know, like the main question is, is, is development, it's un implicitly, uh, you know, an act of white supremacy and the aftermath of colonialism. Um, and it goes back to, you know, William Easterly's comment of white man's burden. And so, you know, if that's, if that is really what's going on, then um, it, I think it implicates what the solution set is, because it's, it's not just about like tweaking development on the margins, it, it, it's a much more fundamental uh, rethink. So I just, I, I kind of, can we agree that that is the problem set? Um, or is it, is it, you know, I think that there's always this question of intersectionality, like that's one problem of, of a whole bunch of other problems. Um, but, but I would just like to throw that as a kind of a first question. Can we just jump in? Or Please, I... and I think like it's it's a place where we can have a, a conversation. Yeah. So if, if you guys want to go off mute and we can just, you know, like, or however you want to do it, but yeah. Okay, so thank you for that question. Thank you, Errol, for posing it and for being here. I know you're speaking next in another conference. So I really appreciate your presence here. Um, but, and, and I think it's a really important one because I also want to um, tie it into um, Nas' last question or invitation, basically, like how do we go about this? And I would say what I have found helpful is I think all the critiques I've, I've voiced now was uh, how I see aid and development discourse manifesting itself in our worlds, let's say, at the moment. But um, for instance, engaging with works from people like uh, Walter Rodney, uh, who wrote uh, How Europe uh, Underdeveloped Africa, for instance, the idea of development, I think it's important for us to to backtrack to the point where we remind ourselves that that also is a completely normal human condition where, and you know, I'm paraphrasing really badly, but it's basically how um, to adapt to your environments to live, thrive, survive, whatever. And so that's, a, that's like a, a really super open definition of development that I think that's the thing we should return to rather than trying to fix our development policies and discourses today. And I think for that, the idea of white supremacism, where, you know, as I also use the other, it's not the other word, but let's say white supremacism as it um, has manifested itself and perfected itself and disguised itself in a logic of racial colonial capitalism, let's say in the last 400 years, then we do know that our challenge today cannot be to fix the technocracy even fix the bottom up fix. It's really about much more fundamentally um, think where do we need to stop the imposition? And I think that's that's where it's it's a difficulty if we then immediately go to the policy level. That it's just really difficult to 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 balance these two at the same time. And so that's where I would say um, that it's extremely important to remind ourselves that this is not a conversation we can have without addressing where we are having it from. So I, I think we should really let go of this desire to have a general advice for the world at large, because that's very much part of the colonial reflexes where we think there is a universal place where we can come up with solutions more or less for all. I know that my conversation about white supremacism, blackness, colonial imposition, whatever, are different if I am listening to my colleagues in Rwanda, for instance, where I'm from, than when I'm having them 
in my classroom in the UK, even if it has all the colors of the rainbow, or if we're talking amongst ourselves, maybe being part of the World Bank or the, all the other institutions. Let's be specific so that we don't reproduce um, the idea that there is a universal answer to this question. Everybody, I think, has a different responsibility and different priorities. And I would say from a Western positionality, we have to really resist the desire to keep on formulating policies for others. And with that, I have not said because the local elites are better. It's just, it's not our place. It's not our place. And this, it's not even just about this interest. It's just the only way we restore the understanding of a shared humanity of all is that we don't assume that we know better. And it's really something that we will have to unlearn. How that translates for an, a person working in an office for the UN, that's, that's again, a, something that needs to then be defined in more detail there, right? But there are some bigger questions that, that precede anything we could come up with in terms of, of, of policy formulations, I think. So that would be my answer to, I do think from a Western positionality, let's engage with white supremacism because it hurts our sentiments, not, not like personally, but it's just like it stands against the lie of what we were thinking we were engaging with. And that's the painful conversation, but so thank you for that question. If I if I could just also comment on that, um, you know, Olivia, I, lo I love the, the the definition that you that you um, provided there of, de of, of development, how to adapt, live, thrive, and and survive in, in whatever context in, in in which you find yourself. And and you know, to be perfectly honest, I, maybe Abe was hoping that we might disagree with each other a little bit more, but I, I really agree with with almost sort of everything you said there, and I fully kind of take it uh, take it on board. I think especially your kind of you know um, sort of uh, sort of, um, you know, request to us that we not think and focus on process, that we not kind of take the world as given and say, how can we tweak it or fix it? I mean, I 100% agree with that. I think where I might sort of push back a little bit is on this question of um, how do we, if we don't think about process at all, um, how do we make sure that outcomes that we would, uh, you know, from a perspective of a shared humanity and from a perspective of uh, social, economic uh, well-being, uh, you know, lived experience uh, and, and so on, how, how could we, um, how do we think about the harm that might be imposed on indigenous populations in the developing world if we were to fully retreat, right? And I, I think about it, I mean, I'm, you know, uh, sort of, I've been spent enough time in the develop, developing world that, you know, I have a, a, a neoliberal kind of economic framework still in my mind to think about sort of cost benefit analysis. If there's a, a harm that is being imposed, a moral harm that is being imposed by a retreat, um, how can we sort of think about what our, responsibility is as, as sort of global citizens interested in a shared humanity, how to ensure that um, that harm is not uh, worse than the harm that has been imposed by white supremacist and capitalist uh, models of development. I also, I want to just throw in to this, which Olivia, I'll give you a chance to go back to this, but I also think there is a question of even the passive ways uh, in which the international development model occur outside of active engagement by, let's say, the World Bank or the U.S. Or you know, so I um, was traveling in China, and of course, everybody holds up China as this example of a development miracle, where you you know all these people were brought out of poverty, and um, and just from a visual inspection, it was often kind of the the world that you describe, Nas, of these huge towers that are built in this very urban, um, you know, it looks like a very radical transformation of people's lives. And then the question is always, is this a better world that has been created where benchmarks have been met? And, you know, and, and I don't really know how to solve that question, but in that case, it wasn't the international organizations were forcing but there was a, a, a mental map of how do we be a capitalist society or how do we engage with you know, global capitalism, which forces people in one direction. So I just, I just wanted to add that into this conversation. But Olivia, I think you wanted to, um, to add to what Naz was saying. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's, it's, it's a good question. It's, um, it's not about not engaging process. It's about not engaging in process first and especially process elsewhere. 
And I know like we, we, we have this idea that we should imagine a world without borders and whatever. And I'm the first one to say that, that the, the, the practice and the imagination of the world as bordered is the, is the thing that kills so many people premature that any of these things and deeply racialized as well right so but what i'm what i'm trying to get at is let me get let me give a very concrete example that i'm again, again probably going to butcher but you know let's say the ebola crisis beginning you know um uh, 2013 14 15 in west africa uh, and we were talking about this in my classroom because, you know, I do teach international development studies and I find myself often in, in a pickle because I basically want to tell my students, don't do it, don't go there. But, you know, it's at least I have three years to explain what I mean with that. But we were thinking about um, all the different initiatives that came uh, about that, right? And the way, the reason why this is a good example is obviously that um, retreat does not mean people are dying of a particular disease in a particular place, let's not care about it. But it's about, first of all, historicizing why contracting uh, Ebola, and I'm, I'm sure we could talk about COVID as well, but contracting Ebola in West Africa at that time does potentially kill someone at a much higher rate, but the Americans or the, or the Spanish persons that contracted it did not die, right? So we know we don't die of, of the disease themselves, but it's the institutional framework and again, we can think as this concerned global human family from that perspective, what has been our role amongst other structural adjustments, whatever, to make that some people die of something somewhere and not somewhere else. So what does that mean for the present then? I would be the first one to invite any of our NGOs to procedurally in very much detail, march to the European Commission, march to wherever they need to go in Washington, to systematically fight um, patent laws and intellectual property rights, but the whole pharmaceutical industry, right? So the example I give here, and again, it's much more complicated than that, is to understand that retreat is not about not taking your responsibility or even repairing what we did, but it's about understanding that keeping the model where you do test your rapid reaction force, sending a handful of doctors and then so shipments of, um, of medicine. I'm not even saying stop doing that. The moment that people are dying, just do whatever you can. But to understand that that is in no way a dislocation of power or an ending of the harm or actually offering any solution that warrants us to say that we are less harmful than any of the other local elites could be doing, right? So that for me is, is a way of engaging with, with um, both repair and retreat. It's not, it's not less interesting and it's not even non-procedural. It's just that, um, yeah, we have to stop this, this zero point moment of innocence in which we walk in and say, how can we best send doctors? It's, yeah. it's disingenuous and it's deeply harmful. And, and I think that it happens on so many uh, levels. So, you know, I was recently teaching uh, monetary politics and, you know, why do people have a crisis in monetary politics? Because they're not competitive, you know? And so it starts with the, well, how do we make them competitive? You know, we need to uh, electrify them and you know, <laughs> electrocute them basically. But, you know, it's, it's just like totally ignoring the colonial experience, which then led them to the situation where they are. And so in order, in, like, if we can't just start from that acknowledgement and say, there's a structural condition that has been imposed on so many people in our world, and we have to rectify, you know, or at least acknowledge and then think about that before we get into putting in place policies that will never work because they do not address these, you know, larger structural conditions. I was also talking to the speakers before the panel started about the book, uh, the Ministry of the Future, which is about climate change. And it, it makes a similar point about that of like, you know, you can talk about commitments to the climate accords, the Paris, uh, you know, accords, but none of that is is even interesting if you don't start from the kind of the, the um, colonial impact that then led to our current cri uh, climate crisis. And then all these societies have to manage that. And we have to start by addressing that um, deep-seated racial um, inequality that is playing out in the, the climate crisis. Okay, there's a lot of other uh, rich questions. Um, so one is, 
you know, go, goes to the practicality. This is addressed to Nas, uh, but I think Olivia might also um, have something to say here, which is, you know, I'm going to restate the question a little bit of just what did the practitioners do um, and also manage, let's say, their own conscience, with, you know, if you recognize that there are these um, deep-seated racial inequalities, structural, um, you know, violence that have happened by the international community. If you're a practitioner in this setting, you know, is there a way to create change from the inside or is it just something that, you know, you, we have to give up on this project? So I'm, I'm massaging the language a little bit, but I think that's the heart of the question. Um, I don't think I was quite prepared for this existential crisis at uh, 1049 mountain time on a, on a Thursday <laughs> morning, but it's a, it's a fabulous question and really kind of gets to the heart of, you know, things that I've kind of grappled with personally. And I think what this field is grappling with kind of, uh, you know, writ large, I mean, I think, you know, let me kind of take, uh, the World Bank um, and talk about some, some of my colleagues there and, the, and you know the kind of cohort of people with, with whom I entered are some of the most um, you know well-intentioned uh, sort of good-hearted people I know who really understand and uh, fully kind of apprehend and live the experience that you know that we're, that we're talking about here the the sense that you you know you cannot uh, in good conscience engage in in, in this line of work um, if you don't uh, sort of apprehend the the historicized nature of the context in, in, in which we're working and uh, you know the, the 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 racial colonial white supremacist harm that has been done um, and I think that at the end of the day um, you know that there are people who sort of even understanding that sort of believe from a pragmatic perspective that there is still work to be done that that sort of somebody sort of needs to, to undertake right and I think I would kind of come back again uh, to the question of for me it really becomes what is the alternative and to whom are we leaving the indigenous populations of the developing world um, and I, kind of hammer back on this point then, and Olivia, I don't mean to imply that you're suggesting otherwise, but that local elites are often themselves manifestations and representations of the same historicized patterns, um, and they're replicating and reinforcing those same colonial dynamics um, in slightly different ways. So Abe, I think your, you know, your, your, um, picture of the sort of Chinese, uh, you know, uh, development uh, skyscrapers is kind of the, you know, the steroids version of the Lao development clusters, right? It's the same notion of, well, you know, um, you know, if we're leaving uh, uh, the, the, the developing world and, and poor people in the developing world to their own elites, uh, are we leaving them to a fate that is worse than that, that, you know, we could, uh, we're, we're coming to circling back around the same question of what is the relative moral uh, harm that is being imposed? Right, so or not imposed, me, but at least accepted. Um, yeah, let me just add to this. Um, Kate McNamara, she asks, kind of like, could we talk a little bit more? Maybe Olivia could speak a little bit more about the idea of repair um, instead of aid. And uh, what would it look like? How is it in tension with, um, you know, ideas of, of real world sovereignty? Or does it even, you know, like, is that an issue or uh, kind of methodological nationalism? Is it, uh, is the world genuinely in flux today to allow for such an opening? And, and I would just say that I think these conversations are so important because at least it, you know, it's like the ideas that stood behind the, the reckoning that happened in the United States and the world, I think they've been percolating through, you know, academic communities for, you know, as Olivia said, for generations. But I felt like you, you saw all that work really uh, explode into you know the mainstream in the last uh, year, and so is there a similar kind of thing that can happen in the in the aid world where you get these concepts that then can be leveraged and exploited at key moments? But I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. No, it's it's really excellent questions. I get to get to the heart of it. Um, I think I think what what uh, the reason why I brought up the fact that you know let's say just in post-development studies is like really four decades, something like that, right? What I think we need to, 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 to learn from it is probably try and focus on what are the ways in which we are in a ritualized way trained to forget these epiphanies. And, and, I, and that's extremely important for now because we are very close still to the past summer where, and now we all remember still, 
But, you know, even in Belgium, we'd had like the similar conversations, whatever. But the very powerful thing that is with us, and let's call it white supremacy, for instance, in our context. And I don't think that's the only force of evil on planet Earth. I just think that's the most relevant one uh, from which we can speak. Um, and that's why I always really want to ground and situate the points, even though I know most of us, myself included, have been trained in trying to come up with generalizations for, for all of humankind. Um, it's, um, for me, it's, it's, it's so deeply ingrained in, in a desire to hold on to a status quo, even if it's quoted in the industry that is aid and development that really stands for the opposite. We try to think for change. We try to make policies for change. Like change seems to be the change model, all the different you know, project cycles that we have. Change seems to be at the heart of it, strangely enough. And I think that's where I would like locate the harm and why I connected to mastery and why I connected to, it does the opposite. And I think that um, Naz, what, what is helpful for me to hear you repeat the question of, are we sure we're not leaving them to something worse? It's a valid question, but I do think it's a question that, um, that we have been trained to perceive as the most natural question to ask. Because there is no historic track record that even warrants us to have that as a first concern. And, and, um, and, and I think the way that I want to, to uh, illustrate that maybe very briefly, I was, um, I, I, as a journalist, I was in, in Niger uh, talking to one of the parliamentarians um, and I was trying to get at, you know, how come you guys don't, he was talking about not having the freedom to create their own policies or whatever, right? And again, the story is more complex than, than I'm gonna tell it, but it's basically, he was saying that he was, um, which direction was it? So it was a minister of, um, of finance or whatever that presented the budget of Niger to the parliament and parliamentarians were to vote on it, right? And so at some point he could see that people were trying to vote on it or have amendments or whatever. And he said that that minister cut us all off by saying, listen, it has been approved already in Washington at the various institutions. There is no point in us having this long winded conversation because if we amend it, you know, a lot of the different incomes, parts of the budget that actually come from the outside won't come through. And again, it's a simplified, but for me, when we then go and disassociate these local elites from our own connection to them, then again, we're having a disingenuous conversation about where the harm is. And with that, I have not said that there's no local responsibility, whatever, but it's a bit like blaming people for corruption, forgetting that corruption is always a relational thing that always includes where Swiss banks or whatever, you know, and all the, 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 the positive things that we still get out of it. So that would be my invitation. When we ask the question, would they not be left of worse to try to backtrack where we even get that as the most natural question. And then, yeah, let's do all the research that needed to, to, to unravel that. Um, and then I, I want to come back on repair as well, but maybe also I'm, I'm sure there might be an, another round as well. Um, also there, I think it's such a layered question where I think we should shift first and foremost, who gets to answer the, the question of what repair should look like. Um, but I think from the Western position, there should be a commitment to wanting to shift the conversation, at least in that direction. And for me as an educator, I'm just thinking what type of training would I give students if they sign up for international development studies versus um, global justice and reparations. And it's and the, both both degrees would speak to this human family image that that was drawn up because I do think that the solidarity thing is is a is an important one. But how do we understand that in an anti colonial way that means that I would be teaching different stuff. And I would start somewhere else. I would start in 1492, which I, I try to do now, even though it's still called International Development Studies. But for me, that's where, at least at the cognitive level, where the repair thinking starts, is that um, 
it's not aid and development. It's training ourselves in how can we think what needs repairing and how what does global justice look like? And that can be answered at all levels. I think just you know the composition, the voting rights or whatever at all these global governance structures, like there's so many glaring things that we like wringing our hands. How are we gonna change it? I mean, I'm not even sure why we waste so much time. All of them are so deeply unjust that we can still, I don't know, we can still worry about the local elites because that problem is not going to go away. But there's so much work to be done on our side to start with that um, that's that's where I would, you know, end my answer here. Thank you for the question. So you you might not believe this, but we have reached our hour. So we have one minute left. I know, no, it's it's amazing. Um, but I, I just want to underscore what Olivia said, which is like you know, the kind of when we start with this question, then we have to think about you know the whole role that global capitalism and colonialism and uh, you know, has played in all, all these range of questions. And I think when you start with the question of international development, then you you have this presentist mindset where you're like, how do I fix this problem on the ground right here? And I just I want to recognize there is a problem in many places. There are people suffering and. I think um, Olivia would agree, like if there's a medicine that we can get to those people, but the whole system of intellectual property rights or the whole system of um, how global trade is organized, you know, all of these things um, have a lot more to do with what's happening in people's lived experience than we recognize. And that maybe when we segment them into these subfields of international political economy, we don't have this larger conversation of, uh, well, there needs to be a, a global reckoning when it comes to um, uh, you know, the, the racial injustice that has happened at, at this, in like a very long temporal span and not, you know, uh, not just in the last post-war period. Okay, so um, I would like to just ask our two speakers if you have a final word that you'd like to say, um, speak it now. I, th no, thank you. And I, this has been just absolutely fascinating. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and really learned uh, a great deal. I mean, I think the thing that I would say is that I was sort of at the place where I recognize that the technocratic approach to development is, is folly, as I kind of started out saying, um, and I've been pushing in my own syllabi to kind of understand more the kind of socio-political context. I'm going to move back to 1492 as well after this, uh, uh, after this conversation. So thank you so much. I've spoken a lot, but maybe one thing I would want to say is what I've um, learned the value of uh, the technocratic approach and the detailed empirical research is uh, again something I find in James Baldwin. There is at the same time the need to bear witness, right? So we still need to study in detail what's going on. But I would say for me, my invitation would be let's make sure that we study it not to reinforce the systems or tweak them but to bear witness in detail where it's actually going wrong. And so in that sense, whether it's the abstract theoretical blah or whether it's the study of the details, I think both can be repurposed for what we were talking about uh, today. So thank you, I learned a lot as well. Thanks to both of you for this amazing conversation. I just wanna tell uh, our listeners that there will be a recording of um, this conversation and you can you know, share it. And I, I think they're great for courses, you know, to put video into content for students. There's also, we also have a reading list of uh, recommendations from the different speakers and that we're compiling over the semester. So take a look at that. Uh, we will have our final um, installment of this series is gonna be on illicit markets and uh, their interaction with race in global political economy. And so I hope you join that conversation as well. So thanks again uh, for joining us today and thanks to the listeners. And um, I hope you all have a great day. Okay. Thanks bye. so much.